Okay, if we could turn please in our Bibles to the book of Revelation and the sixth chapter, and I'm going to begin reading in verse nine, and then I want to do a couple of verses from chapter seven as well, as we consider this morning the topic of martyrs and survivors, uh, those that will be martyred for their faith during the tribulation pe period, and those that will survive the tribulation period. So that's going to be the focus of our attention this morning. So beginning in chapter 6 and verse 9, you know, read to the end of the chapter and then into chapter 7. So first of all, verse 9, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their place, places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid, him, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And then please chapter 7 and verse 4, and it says this, And I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the, the tribes of the children of Israel. And then please, verse 9 of chapter 7, it says, After this I beheld in lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word. So as we consider this topic of martyrs and survivors, we're opening the fifth seal now. And again, remember we said that uh, these sevens in the book of Revelation are always in fours and threes. We had four horsemen, and now we've got just simply three seals. The next one, we're going to have trumpets. Yeah, there'll be seven trumpets, but four of them are just the angel blowing the trumpet. And the last three of them are woe judgments. And so, again, there's a distinction between a four and a three. And we'll see that as we go through. We'll, we'll explain them as we come to them. But it's just a consistent pattern that we'll observe as we go through the book of Revelation. So an interesting question uh, that we need to ask is, uh, as we look at verse 9, uh, it says, When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw unto the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. And of course, that's an interesting question, isn't it? How do you see souls? Uh, you know, we're used to seeing a body, but he says he saw souls of them that were slain. And where did he see them? Well, they're under the altar. Uh, that's usually the place where the blood of sacrificial victims was poured out under the altar. I just want to verify that from scripture. Look at a couple of scriptures, the book of Exodus chapter 29. Exodus 29, uh, just uh, showing that that's usually the place uh, under the altar where her blood was poured out. Exodus 29 and verse 12, it says, when thou makest the sum of the children, sorry, that's chapter 30, 29 and verse 12, we read this. It says, thou shalt take of the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy fingers 
and pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. And then Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 7. Again, we get the same picture. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar and sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And so you, you get this idea of blood being poured out. And now we read about these souls and he sees them. The souls of them were slain for the word of God. And, and what does he see? He says that he saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. And in a figurative way, we're shown that as far as heaven was concerned, the death of each of these martyrs was considered to be a sacrifice to God. Uh, the, it was showing the sacrificial nature. They were willing to lay their lives down. Uh, just as we're called today to, to lay our lives down as living sacrifices in this tribulation period, there'll be those that will be literally poured out as sacrifices under the altar because of their refusal to compromise and their belief in the word of God. And we, again, we might ask the question, how did John see the souls? We've talked about this in a prior studies that uh, is there such a thing as an intermittent body uh, before that day uh, when we're given new bodies? And we can't be dogmatic about that, but it seems to me that there's evidence that there is such a thing as an intermittent body. And so, again, he saw this. John witnessed it. Now, we want to ask the question. Clearly, this is martyrdom. And we, we said that uh, these uh, seal judgments, they're... They go along with Matthew 24. They kind of follow along uh, the Lord's Olivet Discourse. And it's what, what he has called the beginning of sorrows. Uh, speaking of the first half of the tribulation period. And again, I want to read from Matthew 24, verse 9 and 10. It says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And so, again, we see this uh, just confirming the words of the Lord Jesus that during that time frame uh, that he talks about this beginning of sorrows, there will be those that will indeed uh, perish as a result of martyrdom during this time frame. Now, of course, the big question is, are these church age saints or are they different group? And we've been saying uh, our premise is that the church is not going to be around during the tribulation period, that will be raptured, will be snatched away before the tribulation period. But there, there will be those that are saved in the tribulation period, and some of them will lay down their lives. Now, now, how do we how do we be believe that? What, what are some of the evidences? I want to suggest to you that both the, the martyrs here and in chapter 7 will indicate that those that believe the gospel in that age are on, on different ground. And I'm going to explain why they're on different ground. This is not the language of church age saints. So notice verse 10, and I want you to notice the, the prayer of the martyrs. It says in verse 10, they cried with a loud voice saying, how long? O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And so their prayer is calling for vengeance on the earth dwellers, those that have done this, those that have been responsible for their death. And it's a return to what we call the imprecatory prayers that you find in the book of Psalms. Where, where they're calling down judgment on God's enemies. And it's certainly distinctly Jewish, and it's certainly out of character with the New Testament era. And so let me give you an example of an imprecatory psalm, and just to see the similarity of how their prayer is for judgment, calling down judgment. Look at the book of Psalms, and particularly Psalm 69. It's a messianic psalm, but it's also an imprecatory psalm. And it gives a clear example of this 
uh, calling down divine judgment on the enemies and S psalm 69 and verse 24 where you read this pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them now that's pretty clear isn't it uh, in the words lord you just pour out your wrath on them deal with them uh, you know kind of we would say modern language zap them lord you deal with these people and so that's that's the kind of language and it's very distinctly jewish and and what i'm saying is it's out of character with church age thinking because in the church age we get uh, the the spirit that ought to be seen in believers in the church age which is very different and we see that in acts chapter 7 for instance with the stoning of stephen and what a beautiful example the first martyr of the church age is and it says in Acts 7, verse 60, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And that's a different spirit, isn't it? It's not, Lord, how long <laughs> before you pour out vengeance on these people? But no, don't lay this sin to their charge. And where did Stephen get that mindset from? Well, I believe he got the mindset from the Lord Jesus himself in Luke's gospel, chapter 23, verse 34, where we read this <clears throat> wonderful scripture, Luke 23, verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And so <clears throat> what I'm saying to you is that I, I really believe that the the church age mentality is what are we supposed to do? Love our enemies. Do good to those that despitefully use you. Pray for them that persecute you. This is the spirit of the church age. But now in this tribulation period, uh, the martyrs have a different mindset. And the mindset is back to what we find in the Psalms. Oh, oh Lord, how long? How long before you pour out your judgment on these people oh long, lord <clears throat> how long oh lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth crying out for vengeance and of course the lord will hear that that prayer of these tribulation martyrs luke's gospel chapter 18 verse 7 it says and shall not god avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him though he bear along with them and so these martyrs are told by the lord in answer to their prayer uh, for him to judge them and uh, avenge their blood it says verse 11 white robes were given unto every one of them and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled and so these martyrs are told to rest for a little while because there are others that will join them there's another company of martyrs that will join them and the martyr role has to be completed and i want to suggest to you that we're, we're going to witness here two different distinct groups of martyrs in the tribulation period uh, we'll explain it a little bit more fully as we develop this this morning but i believe that there's one group in the first half this is the group here that that during the seven seals the first half of the tribulation there's one group of martyrs and then there'll be a further group of martyrs in the second half of the tri tribulation period who will also join them and after that after the second group is complete, then judgment will fall upon their enemies. <clears throat> so that's the opening of the fifth seal. Now we look at the sixth seal. And it says, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood and then it goes on, the stars of heaven fell from the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of them, a mighty wind, the heaven departed as a scroll, when it's rolled together, every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And so we're going to see that in this seal, 
Uh, if the martyrs are told to rest for a little while, that is not true of planet Earth. The martyrs will rest for a while, but the Earth is going to be anything but restful. We're going to observe disturbances in the cosmos and also disturbances in the consciences of men. <clears throat> Two different sets of disturbances. These disturbances in the heavenly bodies and, and in the cosmos and then disturbances in the consciences of men. Because men are going to be recognizing this is not nothing else but the wrath of the lamb and the wrath of the one who sits on the throne. And so their conscience is going to tell them this is divine. Uh, all the excuses are going to go out of the way. Now, I'd like us to just, by way of Old Testament background, go back to the book, uh, Minor Prophets, book of Haggai. And I just want you to see something here in Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. The book of, of Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. And we read here, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. And so the idea is this, that prior to the Lord coming to the earth, uh, to a, a rebuilt temple, and to enter into his glory on this earth, there, there, there's going to be a shaking. I will shake all nations and the earth and the sea and the dry land. There's going to be a shaking. And so this is what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation. Uh, and I, I do believe that these events are best taken literally. Uh, sometimes you read commentaries uh, like uh, Walter Scott's commentary on Revelation, which is very helpful in many ways. But but what he talks about is he uses this and he says, oh, it's just an analogous of there's going to be upheavals in the spiritual realm and in the political realm and all this kind of stuff. But I think it's much more sensible to take this in a literal sense. And so we're going to try and do that to take it in a literal sense. And so we read that there's going to be a great earthquake. And so when he'd opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. And as a result, it's accompanied by upheavals in the cosmic order. Quite often, when there are earthquakes, uh, these what we call seismic events, um, it, it also results in other things happening. For instance, it, it results in often volcanic eruptions, which make the sky seem as black as sackcloth of hair <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> um you know john would be very familiar with this um on the 24th of 24th of august in 79 a.d now remember john is writing in 95 a.d so this is still fresh in john's memory 24th of august 79 a.d mount vesuvius erupted and it destroyed the nearby city of pompeii and John would have been so aware of this event. And here's a description. I'm going to give you, this is a description of the event uh, from historians who witnessed the eruption of, of Mount Vesuvius. It said at 1 p.m. on 24th of August, Mount Vesuvius announced its awakening with a violent eruption. An enormous dark cloud shrouded the blue sky above the volcano. The column of volcanic pumice, hot gases and ash, pushed upwards of nine miles into the atmosphere and spread across, across the skyline like black ink on blotting paper. And so again, as we can consider this, a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. Well, that's again a description of those kind of scenes. Uh, similar testimonies when Krakatoa erupted in 1883. Again, just this is a description. The eruption released sulfur dioxide and other particles such as ash into the air, which filtered the colors of the sunlight uh, <clears throat> surrounding the earth. And so, again, we, we can say this, that, and, and again, it could be purely supernatural, may not even be 
uh, as a result of a, uh, of a volcanic eruption. It could be super, supernatural because, for instance, when the Lord Jesus was crucified, uh, there were three hours of darkness over all the earth. <laughs> and so uh, that could be the case too. But we're just saying that uh, at least the earthquake is literal. Uh, what they're seeing is a literal thing. They're seeing the earth, the, the sky is black as sackcloth. Uh, they're witnessing these kind of events. Uh, the moon became as blood. Uh, and we, of course, we've witnessed blood moons. Uh, we know what that looks like. And so all of these things are resulting in the opening of the sixth seal and then the stars from heaven fell to the earth and again we would think in terms of meteorites coming down and hitting the earth uh, shooting stars meteoric showers all headed in the direction of planet earth and it just looked like a fig tree casting her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind and so there's going to be a lot of meteoric activity coming down to the earth uh, during this time frame and then it says the heaven departing as a scroll when it is rolled together every mountain and island were moved out of their places and so the impression giving given is everything is falling and everything seems to be being wound up many geological cracks and uh, will appear uh, the, the 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 movement uh, the because of the great earthquake it will seem like every island is moving out of its place uh, can you imagine Prince Edward Island? Uh, that's the one closest to many of you. Uh, going to get a, a bit of a movement. And of course, what would that mean? Bridges will collapse. It's going to be amazing, these events. This is going to be something that is going to have such significance. Now, again, I want us to see Old Testament parallels that are important. Prior to the coming of Christ, we have these parallels mentioned. Isaiah chapter 2, because just to go back there. Isaiah chapter 2, uh, to see that this has been prophesied uh, even prior to the first advent of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Isaiah uh, writing 700 years before the birth of Christ at his first advent. This is what he says in Isaiah 2 verse 19. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. And so isn't that exactly what we see here? Uh, the Lord is shaking terribly the earth. And what is the response of man? How does man respond to this? And so it says in verse 15 of Revelation 6, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And so what we're seeing here is this. Not only are we seeing uh, the, the world shaking, but we're seeing a guilty conscience in the human race because although the media, no doubt, will be putting their positive spin on things and trying to give complete naturalistic explanations, maybe, maybe saying it's climate change or whatever is causing all this, the bottom line is that the average person on every, on every level of society is going to know full well what this is. They are going to recognize that this is none other than the wrath of the Lamb and the wrath of him, the face of him that sits upon the throne. And so <clears throat> clearly, there's going to be an acknowledgement, this is divine. Hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. 
not only from the terror of the judgments, but from the face of him that sits on the throne. And it's true, what sinners dread most is not so much death, but the revealed presence of God. When God reveals himself, this is what causes terror in the hearts of men. And so there's this awareness. The great day of his wrath is, is come. And of course, this sixth seal, it concludes with a valid question. And the question is this, who shall be able to stand? And the thought is this, if this is the beginning of sorrows, if this is the first half of the tribulation period, and it is, well, it's so devastating, who's going to survive this? Will anybody be left? Like, who's going to be able to stand? And these are good questions. Who will be able to enter into the millennial kingdom? Is anybody going to survive this? Will there be any life remaining? By the way, isn't it wonderful that as a believer, when it comes to God's wrath, <laughs> we stand. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. <laughs> we have a standing, don't we? We're, we'll, we're able to stand in grace before God's wrath. I declare the gospel which I preach to you that you also received in which you stand, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1, testifying of the true grace of God in which you stand, 1 Peter 5 verse 12. And so we can stand in the face of the great wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb because the Lord Jesus has already borne our wrath in his own body on the tree. But the people of the world, they are going to be very much smitten with the idea that this is none other than the face of him that sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. Now, I want to suggest to you that the sixth seal and this great earthquake brings us to the midpoint of the tribulation period, concluding the beginning of sorrows. And I want to give you the reasoning for my chronology. I just want, I don't want to just state it, but I want to give you some reasoning. And again, it goes back to this first company of martyrs who I believe are going to be joined, as we saw quite clearly, by a second company of martyrs. They're told to rest a while until uh, it says their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. I believe that it's, it divides into two, two sections, first, first group of martyrs, and I believe that they're martyrs, but they're martyred for different reasons. I'm going to suggest to you what the reasons are. The first company of martyrs, I believe, are going to be martyred as a result of the great whore. And look at Revelation 17. There's going to be this one world church, one world religious body. I think it's going to be wider than the church. One world religion that will be brought in. And it, notice it says, speaking of this mystery Babylon, uh, the great mother of harlots, this is Revelation 17, verse 5, uh, an abomination of the earth. And it says, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And so here's this, uh, this counterfeit. Remember, there's the bride of Christ and there's the whore that will be connected with the man of sin. And so this, this whore will be so tied in with the man of sin. But at the midpoint of the tribulation, we recognize that once he's fully established in his position, he, he destroys the whore. He's no use for it anymore. Uh, but these first uh, group of martyrs will be martyred by this great mother of harlots, this great whore. And then the second group of martyrs who will join them, I believe, will be joined as a result of the persecution because of their refusal to take the mark of the beast that will come to prominence in the second half. So notice Revelation 13, verse 6 and 7. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. 
and his tabernacle. This is Revelation 13, 6. And them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And so, again, we see two distinct groups of martyrdoms. First group perpetrated by the great whore. The second group of martyrs by the beast who it was given him to make war with the saints. So the second group will be martyred because uh, when the abomination of desolation is set up in Revelation 12, for instance, again, we get an indication of this, uh, that there will be tremendous persecution, uh, the devil being cast down again, I believe, at the midpoint of the tribulation period, and he's very mad and uh, it, it tells us that he will embark on a on a persecution mission. Again, we'll break in Revelation 12, verse 9. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ. The accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. And it says in verse 12, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and ye that dwell on them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And it will be a, a great persecution mission that he will have on his mind, and he will be making war verse 17 the dragon which was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of god and have the testimony of jesus christ so two distinct groups of martyrs now here's the big question and this leads us to chapter seven and that's why we read from chapter seven we've got martyrs we've got survivors and the question is this who will be saved during the tribulation period and what a great question it is when we see in revelation chapter 7 there are two distinct companies introduced in this chapter in verses 1 through 8 of revelation chapter 7 we see 144,000 sealed servants of god and then in verse 9 through 17 of chapter 7 we see another group who seem to be a saved multitude of Gentiles. And so we have to ask the question about how, how did this happen? How did these people get saved? But one thing I want you to notice is that in the church age, one of the great truths of the church age is what we call Ephesian truth. Remember the middle wall of partition is broken down and that in the church, he's taken of two, twain and made them one new man <laughs> and and so the truth of the church age is that the jew gentile distinction is gone there's one body we're neither jew or gentile bond or free male or female but all one in christ the wonderful truth of the one body but now we're again we're saying we're in a different atmosphere in the tribulation period we have martyrs calling down judgment, imprecatory psalms, kind of re-engaged again. And now, in chapter 7, we have two distinct groups, and, and one group is distinctly Jewish. And it's emphasizing there these, what we call uh, these witnesses, 144,000 witnesses, sealed servants, but there are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then you've got this big Gentile multitude. And again, this, this is what tells me the church is no longer here. The church, one body, uh, is distinct from uh, all the distinctions are gone in this, this one body, the church. And by the way, I just want to say this, and I feel very strongly about this, but Jewish ministries that emphasize, you know, we're Messianic Jews and they're denying Ephesian truth. And, and to me... Uh, I remember we used to break bread in an assembly up in Northern Ireland, 
and there was a brother a next door neighbor he was a converted jew and it was just lovely he was just sat with the saints one of the brethren and that's exactly how it should be and we've got to be careful we're still in the church age the rapture hasn't happened yet and ephesian truth is essential one body neither jew nor gentile okay that i think that's very important to stress but that's going to be reintroduced after the church is raptured and we're going to go back to this distinction so there's this 144,000 jews and then there's a saved Gentile multitude. So we've got to ask the question, who are these two companies? What message have they responded to? Who preached the message to them since the church has been raptured? How did all this happen? Of course, we know that God will never leave himself without a witness. And we also remember this, that one of the marvelous things about God, God is this, that in wrath, God remembers mercy. And although this is a time that we've already read, this is a time of the wrath of the Lamb, but even in this darkest period in human history, right? Remember the Lord said there's never been a time like it and uh, before or since, and yet God is still going to show mercy and souls are going to be saved. And I want us to just look for a moment at the book of Habakkuk, uh, or Habakkuk, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, and uh, tremendous, <clears throat> tremendous book. Uh, in the Minor Prophets, and as we look at this book, we're going to just observe in Habakkuk the uh, the scripture that I have in mind that uh, emphasizes that God in wrath remembers mercy. And so it's Habakkuk 3, verse 2, and it's a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon uh, Shigeonath. O Lord, I have heard thy speech, and was afraid, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. And he's just been told about judgment that's going to come uh, on the nation of Judah. The Babylonians are coming to bring judgment. And his prayer is, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. That even in the midst of upheaval and wrath and judgment, would you do a reviving work and in wrath would you remember mercy and certainly we're going to see that even in the tribulation period that god in wrath will remember mercy and there will be a great multitude saved so who are these people going to be well the one thought is that they're not going to be souls who have heard the gospel in this age but rejected it and the minute after the rapture, they suddenly realized their terrible mistake, and they got saved. Uh, Second Thessalonians seems to suggest to us, and let's look there, please. Second Thessalonians two, and I know it realizes different opinions about this, um, but it would it would seem from this passage, Second Thessalonians two verse ten. It says, um, when he shall come to be glorified, that's chapter one, sorry, chapter two, verse 10, there we go. And with speaking of the man of sin, it says, verse nine, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Then it says this, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And so it seems that people who had opportunity to be saved, but they didn't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. It says, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they also might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And it, it would seem to me that the thought is this, that the Lord takes men seriously. And if you don't have the love the truth and you don't want the truth, the alternative to the truth is the lie. If you don't want Christ, the alternative is the man of sin. And so this is going to be the scenario. And so we want to just see that in verse uh, chapter seven, I want to first of all just emphasize that it's it is a parenthetical passage. It forms no part of the chronological sequence in the book 
of revelation. And I, I think I've said that before, but I want to say it again, that in the book of Revelation, what moves us forward is the judgments, seals, trumpets, bulls. But periodically, in the middle of them, there's there's a pause in the action and and there's a parenthesis. And usually it's answering a question. So in this case, it's answering the question, who will be able to stand? And the thought is, is anybody going to be saved at this time? Is there is there anybody going to survive this tribulation period? And so it's answering that question. So he's kind of pausing the action and he's going to look at this parenthetical section. And in doing so, it's not part of the chronological sequence, but he's going to help help us to understand the conditions on earth during the seal judgments retrospectively. We've already looked at them, but he's going to show us what was happening during that time. And also during the trumpet and bowl judgments prospectively. And so he's, he's kind of, this is not part of the sequence at all. In fact, I believe that these that we're going to read about were actually sealed before the tribulation began itself the action is paused amidst climaxing judgments to answer the question who shall be able to stand and we're going to see that god has already sealed his servants before the seals were opened so notice first one after these things i saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in our foreheads. And I heard the number of them that were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. The thought is this, the storm is restrained until this company is sealed. And so these angels that, that clearly have power from God to bring judgment, they're told to hold back the judgment, hold back the storm. Right? They're standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind shouldn't blow. In other words, the storm could not break until the servants of God are sealed. So God is restraining divine judgment until these are sealed. And again, this is just a thought. I can't be dogmatic about it. But I wonder, does this imply a gap between the rapture and the breaking of the first seal until these servants of God are sealed. Okay. And there was storm, don't blow. No, no storm clouds coming on the earth until the servants are sealed. So the rapture has occurred, but could there be a gap? I, I believe there could be. And, and the reason I believe that is if you remember that even after the Lord's resurrection, there was a 40 day period wasn't there uh, and then before pentecost the beginning of the church age there was there was a, there was this gap period but god is getting things ready and i suggest that there could be the same thing that, uh, that there could be a gap between the rapture and remember we said that the, the the tribulation period does not begin with the rapture it begins with the signing of the covenant right it's the signing of the peace deal the treaty is the beginning of the tribulation period. So after the rapture, perhaps there is this time when the servants of God are sealed. The storm is about to break. Now, again, I just want to talk about the four winds of heaven, just uh, how that is always indicative of judgment about to come. Let's look back at Jeremiah, for instance, chapter 49 and verse 36. Jeremiah 49, verse 36 well, we read this, it says, and upon Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven 
and will scatter them toward all those winds, and there shall be no nation whither the outcasts of Elam shall not come. So again, the idea of bringing the four winds from the four quarters of heaven is to do with judgment, scattering, uh, the, the uh, indignation that's going to be poured on the outcasts of Elam. So you get an idea there. That's how it's used elsewhere. Remember we said as we, as we study Revelation, uh, the Old Testament flows into this book. A lot of the pictures symbolism is explained to us elsewhere in the Old Testament. Four, of course, is the universal number. It points to the four points of the compass, for instance. And so there's a universal storm. Uh, we've said wind is often related to judgment. Let me read another one from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 51 and verses 1 through 4. Uh, these winds of adversity, we might say. Thus saith the Lord, this is Jeremiah 51 verse 1. Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind. And will send unto Babylon fanners that shall fan her and shall empty her land for in the day of trouble, they shall be against her roundabout, against him that bendeth, let the archer bend his bow, against him that lifteth himself up in his brigandine, and spare ye not her young men, destroy ye utterly all her host. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and, and they that were that are thrust through in her streets. And so again, what does God say? He's going to raise up a destroying wind so the tribulation is about to sweep the earth sweep over the earth as a destroying wind as we've seen we've witnessed it already in the seals and so god <clears throat> is uh, before the judgment is going to do a great work of salvation the work of judgment must give place to the more important work of salvation god uh, is a God, our savior. He's a saving God. And so he's going to save a multitude. And so we see verse two, I saw another angel ascending from the east. Of course, the angel ascending from the east where the sun rises. Sun rising marks the beginning of a new day. We're, we're moving towards that moment when the son of righteousness is going to be revealed with healing in his wings, Malachi 4.2. And so this angel coming down, as it were, ascending from the east, it means that we're getting close to the day coming when the sun will rise. But before it, you know, what did they say? The darkest period is just before the dawn. And so there's this period of great darkness that is going to happen. Now, again, we, we just want to get sidetracked here, but the morning star <laughs> always appears before the sun appears because the morning star is venus but it's also a picture of the rapture uh, the rapture occurs the morning star the, uh, appears before the son of righteousness so we're we're after the rapture we're waiting for the son of righteousness coming with healing in his wings and there's this angel ascending from the, the east and it says concerning this angel having the seal of the living god and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to her the sea, and so on and so forth. So what is the meaning of this seal of God that the angel has that he's going to seal these 144,000 witnesses? We've been looking at seals that were broken, <laughs> the six seals opened. Now we're going to look at seals that cannot be broken. And so it's just kind of an interesting contrast. And so first of all, a seal is a mark of ownership slaves and soldiers especially the imperial guard had a visible tattoo on their hand or their forehead or neck to show that their allegiance was known they belonged to the emperor they were they were sealed to show they were owned as it were they were the property of the state so to speak marking one's own property let's look at second timothy just for a moment chapter 2 and verse 19 2nd Timothy 2 verse 19 speaking of church age saints it says nevertheless the foundation of God stands sure having this seal the Lord knows them that are his and of course we're sealed aren't we by the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption uh, but here in this tribulation time 
uh, a seal will be a mark of ownership. It's also a mark of security. Again, I would, would suggest to you that Ezekiel should be kept in our minds here and Ezekiel chapter 9. The book of Ezekiel chapter 9, wonderful, wonderful portion of scripture where God is about to bring judgment upon Jerusalem because of the abominations that were seen in that city. And we read, in, and I'm going to take the time here to read Ezekiel 9, 1 through 7, because it has great relevance to our passage here. He said, he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice saying, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand and behold six men came from the way of the higher gate which lieth toward the north and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand and one man among them was clothed with linen with a writer's inkhorn by his side and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar and the glory of the god of israel was gone up from the the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house and he called to the man clothed with the linen which had the writer's income by his side and the lord said unto him go through the midst of the city through the midst of jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof and isn't that encouraging, by the way, no matter how bad Jerusalem was, God never leaves himself ever without a remnant. And there was a remnant there and they sighed and they cried because of the abominations that were done in the midst thereof. It broke their hearts when they saw the abominations going on in the house of God. And to the others, he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. They began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth, and he went forth and slew in the city. So, so the idea is this. You slay everybody, men, women, and children. The only ones who are not to be slain are the ones who have the mark. So we need to just be aware of that. So <clears throat> only uh, those that are, have the mark were to be spared. And again, we would suggest to you that that's exactly what's going to happen here. He's going to seal his servants. And when we get to chapter 14 of Revelation, we're going to see these sealed ones again. And what we're going to find when we get to Revelation 14 is that despite the, the man of sin and despite Satan's anger, at the end of the tribulation period on Mount Zion, accompanying the Lamb are going to be 144,000 sealed witnesses. Not one of them will perish. And so they're secure. They're, they're going to be secure throughout the tribulation period. By the way, sealing for us in this dispensation is a mark of our eternal security. Sealed with the Spirit of God until the day of redemption. It's a certainty that we truly belong to him. Now, one last thing, because our time has gone. Can't believe how quickly this hour has gone this morning. And we're not done where we need to be. But but I want you just to see in the tribulation period, it, it, everybody's heart will be on their sleeve. There's going to be no question who belongs to who. God's people are going to be sealed. And then they're going to have their mark. And then those that follow Antichrist are also going to have their mark. And their uh, Revelation 13, 16, and 17, they're going to take the mark of the beast. And there'll be no fence. <laughs> There's going to be two distinct categories of people. But these that are sealed, they will survive the tribulation period, this 144,000. They're, they're a mark of ownership. They belong to God, a mark of security. But so many questions. How did they get saved? <laughs> well, you're going to have to wait till next week to find out how these people got saved. And then what did they do once they got saved? We're going to see something of their glorious ministry. And so we'll have to wait till then. But in the meantime, 
isn't it good to know that as a believer in the Lord Jesus, we're sealed by the Spirit of, of God until the day of redemption. Amen.